first problem I want to talk about today is called register allocation. So the problem is quite easy. Suppose that you have a program and in your program, you can use as many variables as you like. Uh, but actually when the compiler compiles the program, it has to make some choices because generally we have two different types of memory. We have register memory, which are registers of the processor and much easier to access and much faster. And we have the main memory, which is basically our RAM. It's much bigger, but accessing it takes more time. So the question in register allocation is, suppose that I want to put all of my variables into registers. So I don't want to save anything on the RAM. I want to save everything in my processor. How many registers would I need? That's the question. So generally, the way this works is that we model it actually as a graph problem. And we create a graph where we put one vertex for each one of the variables in our code. So let's say that your code had some variables x, y, z, and maybe w. And then each one of these variables has a lifetime, right? So you should remember this hopefully from compilers courses. And if two variables have lifetimes that intersect, if two variables can be alive at the same time, then we cannot put them into the same register. And what we do to model this as a graph is that we consider what we call the interference graph, which is this graph that I have here, one vertex for every variable, and I put an edge between two variables if their lifetimes intersect. So in other words, if I have an edge between two variables, those two variables cannot go to the same register. Now the question is, what is the minimum number of registers that I need? And of course you can see that this is basically a graph coloring problem, right? So I want to color this graph with the minimum possible number of colors so that the colors at the two ends of every edge are different. So this is our register allocation problem. So it might seem odd to you that I talked about registers and programs and so on, whereas I could just say, I have a graph, I want to color it, right? But the reason I'm using the concept of programs is that actually programs have something called a control flow graph. And this is a different graph. It's a graph where I put one vertex for every line or every statement in my code. And then I put a directed edge if the execution of my program can go from this line to that line. So for example, if my program is something like while something, and then inside this, I have an if, let's say the if has an else part and that's it. So let's say this is my program. I just assign one vertex to every line or every statement in my control flow graph. So I have one vertex for while, I have one vertex for if, I have one vertex for this line here. I don't put a vertex for else. I have one vertex for this line here. And let's say I have one vertex for the end of my program. Just one vertex that shows my program has terminated. Now, what would be the edges in my control flow graph? Well, from this while, if the condition is true, I can go inside the if. So I have an edge like this. I can go inside the while and go to the if. If the condition is false, I just go to the end of my program. Now from this if, if its condition is true, I go to this part, execute whatever command I have here. Otherwise I go to this part and execute whatever I had here. Now, after this line is executed, I have to go back to my while loop, right? So I have an edge like this. And the same thing happens with line four here. So after this command is executed, I have to go back to my while. So this is what we call a control flow graph. Now, of course, the control flow graph and the interference graph are very different graphs. 
And especially what I want you to see is that the control flow graph is pretty sparse. So if you consider, for example, any vertex in your control flow graph, the number of edges that go out of this vertex is going to be at most two, right? So uh, this is a sparse graph, but this is not necessarily a sparse graph. So now I want to use the sparsity of this graph to find a good way uh, to color this one. And of course, I want to have an approximation. Now, first of all, what do I know about the sparsity of this graph? This is a theorem that I'm not going to prove for you, but I'll give you a reference to it. So control flow graphs have uh, small three bits. So for every control flow graph G, we know that the three bits of G is at most seven. It depends on your programming language a little bit, but this is a very well-known result. So we know that this graph looks like a tree. It has found a tree bit, but we want to color this graph. Now, what is the connection between the two graphs? So here I have one vertex for every line of my code. Here I have one vertex for every variable in my code, right? But as I said before, every variable has a lifetime. So the lifetime of a variable is a subset of this graph, right? And of course, the lifetime of a variable has to be a connected subset of this graph. So in other words, every vertex in my interference graph, each one of these variables corresponds to a connected subset of vertices in my control flow graph, which are the lifetime of that variable. And now I want to color this interference graph with as few colors as possible. Now, this problem is actually NP-hard. Uh, again, I'm not going to prove too many NP-hardness results here, but let's see how we can use the parametrization by the three bits of this graph and also some basic techniques from approximation to get an approximation algorithm. There. Okay, so first of all, Let's just consider a simplified case. Let's consider the case where this graph has bounded pass bits. So let's say I have a pass decomposition of this graph. Actually, I call this graph G. Let me call this graph H so that I can always talk about both of them. So let's say that I take some pass decomposition of G. So let's say this is a pass decomposition of G. Okay, so this is a pass decomposition of G. And let's say that the width of this pass decomposition is W. Okay, how does this pass decomposition help me color this other graph? Well, what do I know about a decomposition? I know that every vertex of the original graph G has to appear in a connected uh, subtree, or in this case, subpaths. So it has to appear in some segments here, right? But on the other hand, each variable in my graph H corresponded to a connected subgraph of my graph G. So if I just keep track of all the variables that appear here, so here I, at each one of my bags, so let's say I have a bag B, I had a set V of B, which were vertices of G that are in this bag, right? This was a subset of the vertices of G. But I can also assign a set of variables, a set of vertices of H to each one of these bags, right? So let's say that I show this with X and E of H, and this one is just V and E. Okay, so for every bag B, I define X of B as the set of variables that were alive at some point in this bag. Okay, so X of B is the set of variables such that the lifetime of this variable X, I write LT for lifetime, has an intersection with the bag B. 
So there is some line of code in this bag B where the variable X was alive. Okay. Now, what's the problem here? The problem is that I know I have very few vertices at every bank. I know that I have at most W plus one vertices at every bank, but I don't know how many uh, variables I can have at every bank because you can easily imagine that I can have a program where a lot of variables are alive at the same time. Maybe I have a program where I define a lot of variables at the beginning and I use all of them at the end, so all of them intersect. Okay, so here I cannot assume that the number of variables is bounded, but I can assume that the number of vertices or lines at every bag is bounded. Okay, now I want to find the coloring, right? So First of all, can I find a lower bound on how many colors I need? So if let's say I take one vertex of my control flow graph and I look at all the variables that were alive here. So let's say that at vertex two, I had variables X, Y, T. Let's say I had these three variables alive, right? Do you agree that these three variables cannot go into the same registers? Because of course they intersect all at vertex two. So I, I cannot color them with the same color here. So if I just go over each one of my vertices in G and I just look at how many variables I have. And if I take the maximum, I need at least that many colors because I need to color every variable that appears. So Let's give that a name. Let's call it alpha. So alpha is the maximum over every possible vertex of control flow graph of the number of variables that are alive there. So number of variables such that the lifetime of X includes V. Okay, so I know that I need at least alpha colors. Now I just want to do a greedy coloring. What is my greedy coloring? I say, start in this path decomposition and just go from left to right. And whenever you see a new variable that was not colored before, just give it the smallest possible color. So when you see the first variable, color it one. When you see the second variable, if it was not connected to the first variable, color it one, otherwise color it two and so on. So every time you see a variable, just look at all of its neighbors and find the smallest color that is not used in any of the neighbors and give this variable that color. So that's my coloring, greedy, very simple. Now, I have to somehow argue that this simple coloring is going to give me an approximation so I know that I need at least alpha colors. Let me try to prove that the number of colors that this greedy algorithm uses is something times alpha. Okay, so how many colors can I possibly use? So let's say that I've colored from left to right. And at some point, I have some variable X here. And now it's the turn of variable X to be colored. So first of all, this means that this is the first bag that contains X because X, if X was already appearing before, I had already colored it, okay? But now when I'm coloring it, I cannot use any of the colors that I've used in its neighbors. So I have to just figure out how many of its neighbors could potentially be colored. How many neighbors can, the variable X have that appeared before. Okay. Now, again, remember that this was a past decomposition of G, not of H. So this variable X is not actually appearing on its own. It's appearing in some vertex V, right? So there was some line of code V where this variable X was alive at that line and that V is appearing in this back. Okay, 
So where do neighbors of V appear? Again, I can do the same thing. I can say that this is the first ever bag that contains V. Because if I had V any sooner, I would have X sooner and I would color X sooner. So this is the first time I'm seeing V. So the neighbors of V can either be in this bag, just where I'm seeing V, or they can be afterwards in the bags that come after this. But I have only colored from left to right. So the only neighbors of V whose variables are colored are vertices of the same back, right? So I have at most W neighbors of V because my width is W. So I have at most W plus one vertices here. So I have at most W neighbors. So I have at most W neighbors of V whose variables were colored, right? But each one of these neighbors can have at most alpha variables in it. So how many colors have I used before getting to X? Well, at most W times alpha, right? But when I get to X, this is a little bit more tricky. I might also have other variables in the same line. So it's actually not exactly W times alpha, it's W plus one times alpha minus one, right? So, this is the number of neighbors that might have been colored before I get to coloring the variable X. So the number of colors that I need, I have at most the colors one to this taken. So I just give this one the color W plus one times alpha. So this shows that the number of colors I use. So I don't know, let's call it K. So let's say I used K colors in my greedy algorithm. K is at most W plus one times alpha. But we said that alpha was a lower bound. We needed at least alpha colors, right? So this is also at most W plus one times the optimal number of colors. So this is a W plus one approximation. Now, of course, I said this with a past decomposition but I can do the exact same algorithm on a 3D composition. So let's say that instead of having a past decomposition of my control flow graph, I have a 3D composition. And as usual, let's say I make it nice and everything. So I have a 3D composition. Now I pretty much do the same thing, except that in the past decomposition, I was coloring from left to right. Here, I'm going to color from top to bottom. So first color all the variables that appear in some line that appears in the root bag, then the next level, then the next level and so on. And then you can do the exact same argument as there. And you can say that this gives a W plus one approximation. Okay. Great. So this is a combination of parametrization and approximation. Now let me switch to a different problem. Oh, and this was also the first example where we had a 3D composition of one graph and we were using it to solve a problem on a different graph. So this is a nice example in that sense too. Okay. So let's talk about another classical problem and let's talk about knapsack. So I'm sure you all know what knapsack is. Basically we have N items and each of our, our items has a value and it also has a weight. So item I 
has a weight of wi and it has a value of vi. And we also have some capacity in our knapsack. So let's say the capacity of my knapsack is C. And the question is find a subset of items so that they fit into a knapsack of size C and have the largest possible sum of value. So our objective is to find some set of indices, which is subset of one to N such that, well, the sum of the weights of all the elements that we pick should be less than or equal to the capacity of our knapsack. And we want to maximize the sum of the values of the elements that we take. Now we've talked about this many times. We've seen how to parameterize it, for example. We've seen that the problem is actually NP-hard, but it's not strongly NP-hard. So we had an algorithm that was pseudo polynomial time for this. Now we want to find an approximation algorithm. Okay, so I just want you to remember the pseudo polynomial time algorithm that we had. So we were just doing a dynamic programming and we would say that dp of i and c prime is the maximum value that I can get if I only use the first i items and if I have a capacity of c prime. Okay, so this is max value using only the first i items with capacity c prime. And we saw that we can easily compute this dynamic programming variables. So what was our total runtime? Our total runtime was basically the number of these variables. And I have N different choices for I, and I have C different choices for C prime. So it was just O and C. Okay. But if I want to approximate the amount of value that I can get, can I just say, well, maybe I take an knapsack of a smaller size? Not really, because even if you make the size of your knapsack a little bit smaller, it might be that you have a very valuable item that doesn't fit in this smaller knapsack anymore, right? So when I'm doing approximation, I don't want to do any approximation with the size. But I can do something like that with the values. So let's say that I limit my values. So for example, if I have many different values and let's say my values are between one and 1000, I just say, I want all of my values to be multiples of 100. And I just round down everything that is not a multiple of 100. Okay, that would probably give me an approximation because now I'm not really changing the sizes and I'm not really changing the capacity. I'm just approximating the value that I can get out of each item. Okay, so that's the basic idea that we want to have here. But before that, you see, I have an algorithm here whose runtime depends on my number of elements and my capacity. So it makes sense to have an algorithm whose runtime is not dependent on the capacity, but instead depends on the values, okay? So what is the maximum value that I can possibly extract? It's just the sum of all the values if I can put everything into my knapsack, right? So here's a very gross oversimplification. So let's say that I just use M to show the maximum possible value. So I define M as the maximum of all the values, okay? Now I know that my answer is somewhere between zero and N times M, okay? Great, so I want to define a different dynamic programming and I want this to be based on values. 
So I want to say dp of i and let's call it m prime is this. So let's say I want to only choose from the first i elements, but I want the sum of values of the items that I take to be exactly m prime. Okay, and I ask what is the smallest knapsack that I would need if I want to do something like this. And of course, I just put this as plus infinity if no such size exists. So dp of i m prime is the size of the smallest knapsack that can contain a subset of the first i elements such that the total value is m prime with total value m prime. Okay, how would I compute this? So let's say that I want dp of i m prime. The base cases are pretty trivial. So if you have no elements, that's trivial. If you have one element, m prime can only be the weight of that element basically. Actually, I can say total value exactly m prime or I can say total value greater than or equal to m prime. It doesn't really matter. I can do the dynamic programming in most cases. Okay, so I want to take a subset of the first i elements so that their value sums to at least m prime and I want to have the smallest possible knapsack for this. Now, again, I can just say I have two cases. Either I take element i or I don't take element i, right? If I do take element i, then what do I need? Well, I need dp of i minus one, but now I already have the value of element i. So I just need m prime minus the value of element i. And of course, I need to add the weight of element i because I have it in my knapsack. Or the other case is that I just don't take the i's element, and that would just be dp of i minus one and m prime. And of course, I want to find the smallest possible knapsack, so I just take the minimum of these two things, right? Of course, you have to do some basic checks as well. Right? Like if this thing, for example, becomes negative, then you don't have this case. But all of that can be done in constant time for each one of our DP variables. So what would be my runtime here? So again, I'm computing each one of my DP variables in constant time. So I'm basically just asking how many DP variables can I have? and Again, I can have n different values for i. How many different values can I have for m prime? I can have anywhere between zero to n times m. m was my maximum element. So my total runtime is n squared m, where m is the value of the most valuable element and n is the number of elements. Okay, great. So now I have another algorithm which is pseudo polynomial time and it's not necessarily better than that one unless your weights are more, much larger than your values. But the good thing about this algorithm is that I can probably do some approximate reasoning here. So before I couldn't say that I take these weights and I round them down or up because that would change my answer a lot. But I can say I take my values and I round them down or up. Okay, so more specifically, let's say that I want all of my values to be a multiple of some number k. Okay, so I just fix some k and I will come back and give it a good value later but just assume that I fixed some number k. And I want the values of all of my items 
to just be multiples of k. So how can I do that? I can take each item and I can say, actually, you know what? Divide its value by k and round it down and then again, multiply it by k, right? So now every item has a value that is a multiple of k. I can even downsize this and I can say, I don't do the multiplication by k at the end. I just take the value of every item and I divide it by k. And if it's not divisible, I round down. Okay. Now I apply the same algorithm over this instance where all of my values are now smaller. So how much time would this take? Well, n remained the same, but m is now divided by k. So my runtime would become O n squared m divided by k. Okay. But here's the thing. This was not a polynomial runtime because our input size is n. How should I choose k to make this into a polynomial time? Yeah, I basically want my k to cancel the n, right? And I want to actually go one step further and I want to be able to give you an epsilon approximation, one plus epsilon approximation. So let's say I set my k to be this. I set it to be the maximum of one and epsilon times m divided by n. And I take, okay. Again, this taking the maximum with one is just so that we don't actually increase our weights. We don't want to increase the weights, right? But for any given epsilon, I can set my k to basically be epsilon times m divided by n. And then this runtime, would just become O n squared m divided by epsilon m. And I have another n, so n cube and the m's cancel. So my total runtime would just be n cube divided by epsilon. And as we've seen before, this is considered polynomial time because if you're looking at something, especially when we're looking at an FP test, we want it to have a polynomial with respect to the size of the input and one over epsilon. And this also gives us that. Okay, so that's the way I'm fixing my K. I'm saying my K is this, and the reason I did it was because I wanted to have a polynomial time algorithm. But does this actually give me a good approximation? So, you see what I'm doing is that I'm basically dividing everything by K and rounding it down. Why would this give me a good approximation of the original one? So I had an original instance of knapsack. I did these things, or if it's easier for you to visualize it, you can say that this is still times K so that instead of thinking about shrinking these down, you can just think that all of my values are multiples of k. It doesn't really matter. So all of my values are now multiples of k. How much does this change my optimal solution? So again, let's say that I have an optimal solution for my original problem, okay? What is that optimal solution? That optimal solution is basically a subset of one, two to n, right? I'm just choosing uh, which one of my elements I want to put into my knapsack. And I can apply the same optimal solution to this knapsack now. Right, But the difference is that all of my values are now multiples of k and rounded down. But how much of a difference does it make? So this optimal solution is a bunch of items, right? 
And each one of these items, well, all of them together fit in my knapsack and I'm not changing the weights, so they still fit in my knapsack. But the question is, uh, what happens to their values? So how much value can I lose on this particular item? So let's say I take an item and its value was VI. But now I rounded that value down and I got what? I got VI uh, divided by K times K. How much can I lose? So in other words, let's say that I call it loss on item I. And I define this as the value it had before, which is VI minus the value that it has now, K times VI over K. What is this thing bounded by? It's bounded by K, right? So for each one of my items, I can lose at most K units of value when I'm rounding down. So overall, how, much, how many units of value can I lose? NK. So basically, what I can figure out is that my answer that I got there, uh, whatever, let's call it ANS, our answer, is less than or equal to the optimal answer plus K, well, how many elements can I have in my optimal answer? I can have at most n, so plus kn. Okay, but what was my k? My k was epsilon times m divided by n. So this is basically the optimal plus epsilon times m, right? I, I don't really care about these things. You can figure out the floors and ceilings yourself. Okay, but I want to write this just as some uh, multiple of the optimal answer. But what can I say? Well, m was the value of my most valuable item, right? So maybe I can, just say that my optimal answer is at least M because at the very least I can take this item. But I can't always say that because maybe my most valuable item does not fit into my knapsack at all. So I first do a pre-processing where I remove all the items that don't fit in the knapsack. And then I do everything else. So now I know that every one of my items on its own fits in the knapsack. So my maximum item, my maximum value item fits in the knapsack. So my optimal is at least M. So this thing, optimal plus epsilon M, is at most one plus epsilon times the optimal. Okay, so for every epsilon, we found an algorithm that has this runtime, N cubed divided by epsilon, and gives us a one plus epsilon approximation. So this is an FP test because uh, the runtime is polynomial in N and one over epsilon, and it works for any epsilon. Okay. So I'm going to now switch to a different problem, but this is also a very classical problem. And this is the problem of bin packing. Okay, so the problem in bin packing is that you have a bunch of containers and let's assume that each container has the same size. Let's fix the size of the containers as one. So we have uh, containers or bins of size one. And let's say that we also have a bunch of items and we want to put these items into containers. 
but we want to use as few containers as possible. So we have bins of size one and we have N items. And let's say that item I has a size uh, of SI. And the question is, what is the smallest number of bins that I need so that I can pack all of these items? And basically you can put as many items as you like into the same bin, as long as the sum of their sizes is at most one. And let's assume that each item also has a size that is between zero and one, because it doesn't make sense to have items that are larger than our containers, then the answer would be impossible. It doesn't make sense to have items of size zero because they don't really contribute to anything. Okay, so we want to see what is the minimum number of bins that we need. Well, first of all, this is an NP hard problem. And this is one of the few cases in this class where I'm going to actually prove to you that something is NP hard because I need the proof. Okay, so our lemma is that bean packing is NP hard. Actually, it's NP complete, but it's super easy to see that it's in NP. So if someone just gives you a packing, you can check that the packing is correct. So it is in NP, but I want to show that it's NP hard. And the NP hardness proof is actually a reduction. And I do a reduction from one of the famous uh, NP hard problems, which is called uh, set partition. So in set partition, you are given a set of numbers. And the question is, can I break this set into two sets? Can I partition it into two sets so that they have the same sum? Okay. And so in set partition, I have some set S, let's call it S1 to Sn. And the question is, is there, uh, some S prime subset of S such that the sum of all the elements of S prime is exactly half of the size of all the elements in S. Okay, we know that this is NP hard. We want to use it to prove that bin packing is NP hard. Now, again, this is kind of super trivial if you think about it. So basically this set partition problem is like bin packing uh, with only two bins, right? So here I said that we have bins of size one, but that doesn't really matter. I can change the size of my bins. I can scale everything up or down, right? So let's say that I have bins of this size, okay? And I have elements of these sizes. And basically the question is, can I put these elements into two bins? Okay, so that's the reduction. The reduction is super trivial. It's just bin packing with two bins is the same as set partition. But why did I care about giving you this reduction? Because it also shows something about approximability. So what this shows is that it's NP hard to even solve bin packing with two bins. So if I think of bin packing as an optimization problem where I want to minimize my approximation ratio, I cannot have an algorithm that has an approximation ratio that is better than three halves, right? Because if I have an algorithm here, let's say I have a three halves minus epsilon approximation for bin packing then I know that this NP hard problem set partition is basically bin packing with two bins. So I can just apply this approximation. And if I apply this approximation, and if my answer is that I can do it in two bins, this approximation is going to give me less than three bins, but less than three bins just is two bins. Like if we're talking about integers, the number of bins is always an integer. 
right? So if I, if I have an approximation algorithm with this approximation ratio, and if I apply it here, whenever I can put items into two bins, I will put items into two bins. And that means that this approximation algorithm solves the NP hard set partition problem. So I cannot have a polynomial time uh, algorithm which has an approximation ratio that is better than one and a half. One and a half is the best possible approximation ratio I can get in polynomial time. Okay, great. So bin packing is NP hard and this is how we say it and hard to approximate. within a ratio of less than three halves unless p equals np. Okay, so this tells me I cannot have an approximation algorithm with a ratio better than this. Let's actually try to get an approximation algorithm with constant ratio and hopefully exactly this ratio. Okay. Again, let's do the simplest possible greedy algorithm. Let's just take our items one by one and Let's put them in the first bin that we can. So I take my first item and I just create a bin for it and I put my first item here. Then I take my second item and if it fits in the same bin, I just put it here. If not, I just introduce a new bin and I put my second item. And I just continue like this. So when I get to the ice item, I have a bunch of bins. I start from bin number one and I just find the first bin where this item fits. And I put it there. And if I don't find any bins where this item fits, I just create a new bin and I put item I there. Okay, this is my very simple greedy algorithm. And actually I think this has a name. Yeah, they call it the first fit algorithm. So you put every item in the first bin where it fits. Now, why does this give us a good approximation ratio? Again, if I want to argue about the approximation ratio, I need to have a lower bound for the number of bins in my optimal solution, right? Then I can use that lower bound to say that the number of bins that I use is not much more than that lower bound, so it's not much more than optimal. Okay, so how many bins do I need at the very least? So here's the thing, consider a case where I can take my items and I can just break them down into smaller items or saw them down. Then do I agree that even with this extra power, the number of bins that I need is at least going to be the sum of the sizes of my items. So the sum of all the sizes, I from one to N, I at least need these many bins. There is no way around that. And actually, because we're working with integers, I need the ceiling of this. So I know that my optimal answer, no matter what, is going to be at least the sum of the sizes. Because that's what I can get, even if I had this extra magic ability of cutting the items, and I don't have that. Okay. Good, so now I have a bound. And I can use this to actually argue about how many bins are used here and how far it is from optimal. Okay, so what can you tell about these bins? So again, let's say that I actually used K bins. So how full or how empty are these bins? I want to claim that I have at most one bin that is less than half full. Okay, 
So this is my lemma. There is at most one bin that is less than half full or that is more than half empty. Actually, I can even say, okay, there is at most one bin that is less than or equal to a half full. I can even take the equal case in. So why can I say that? Suppose that I have two different bins that are half empty, okay? So I have bin I and in bin I, I have some amount, but that's less than half, less than or equal to half. And I have some other bin J and I have something here and this is also less than or equal to half. Now, here's the thing. When I was adding my items, I was always adding the item to the first place where it fits. But whatever item I've added to J could fit in I, so I would never create J, right? So that's it, that's the proof of this lemma. I have at most one bin that has less than or equal to a half. Okay. So what does this tell you? So I have k bins. I want to, let's say, find the sum of all the sizes. The sum of all the sizes is going to be greater than or equal to, well, I have k bins. One of them, let's say the last one, can be kind of empty, but the other k minus one are at least half full. So I have at least k minus one, times a half. Right? I'm basically just counting the uh, sizes that were in the bins that were half full. And I'm ignoring that one bin that was happened. Okay? So just doing this, I get, well, I can say this is strict, right? Because I'm ignoring one of my pins, so this is strict. Okay, so I can say that k minus one is less than twice the sum of all of my sizes. Now I'm working with integers here. So I can say that k is less than or equal to twice the size and okay, so this one was less than or equal to optimum. So this is less than or equal to two optimum. Or, okay, if I want to be more correct, K minus one is less than twice the optimum. So K is less than or equal to twice the optimum. So this gives me a two approximation algorithm. So just doing a very simple greedy algorithm gave me a two approximation. But we proved that we cannot do better than one and a half. So our upper bound and lower bounds don't match here. I have a two approximation. I know that I cannot have better than one and a half approximation. Can I somehow make them meet? Well, here's an idea. What happens if we actually think about what different sizes we have? So right now I'm just adding these items in whatever order they were given to me in the inputs, right? What happens if I sort the items? Does it make sense to add smaller items first or larger items first? if I want to use the same algorithm where I put every item in the first place that it fits. Do you think it's better to first put small items or first put large items? Well, in a sense, it makes more sense to put large items first because I expect that each large item needs its own bin and may maybe I cannot even put two large items together. 
So if I first put all the large items, all the bins that I'm using were, uh, in a sense, inevitable. I had to use those bins. And then I'm fitting in some small items on top. Whereas if I put small items first, it might be that a small item just takes a tiny bit of space and then it makes it so that a large item does not fit, right? So again, this is not formal. This was just some hand wavy thing. So let's say that I change my algorithm and I change my algorithm like this. I say, sort the items so that we have uh, S1, okay, sorry, greater than or equal to S2 and so on to Sn. And then use uh, the first fit algorithm. Now I'm hoping that this would give me a better approximation ratio. And specifically, I'm hoping that it gives me an approximation ratio of three halves, right? Because if I get that, then I'm sure that I cannot do any better. Okay, so let's just consider uh, our K elements again. And I'm just going to do the case where K is uh, divisible by three, but every other case is similar. So just, Assume for a second that K is a multiple of three, okay? And K was the number of bins that our greedy algorithm used. Okay, let's say K is three times K prime. So what do I have? I have three times K prime different bins. And I just say, let's look at the first two thirds and let's look at the last third. So let's say I have bin number one, bin number two, all the way to bin number, okay, I'm going to call it J, which is two times K prime. And then I have J plus one all the way to K, which is three times K prime, okay? Now, I just wanna look at bin J. So this is like two thirds of the way. Uh, what is the largest element that I have in this thing? So I want to say take the largest element in bin J. And let's call this largest element in bin J, let's call that I. Okay. So there are two cases. My first case is if SI is greater than or equal to a half, okay? So if the largest element that got into this bin is a really big element, it's, its size is more than a half, okay? What can I say? Well, I know that all the elements were added in the order of their size from large to small. So if this bin has an element that is this large, then all of the previous bins have to have at least one element that is this size or larger, okay? So now what is the sum of all of my weights? Okay, the sum of all of my weights is going to be greater than or equal to the size of the weights of elements in the first J bins. But, but each of the first J bins have at least one element that is this heavy. So this is going to be greater than or equal to J over two, right? And J was two K prime. So this is just K prime, which is K divided by three. Yeah, this is not great because this only shows that we have a three approximation but I want a one and a half approximation. Okay, so let's try again. Let's do this. Let's say I take the largest element in bin J and I call that element I, and let's say that this element is really heavy. 
So let's say that its weight is strictly more than a half. Now I can say that every one of the bags before J also has an element that is this heavy. But I cannot put these heavy elements together because each of them have a weight of at least a half. So no two of them can go in the same bag. So this means that I need at least J bins, right? So this means that my optimum is greater than or equal to J and J was basically two thirds of K. So, yes. I didn't need to talk about the sum here. I could just talk about each one of these items. Okay, so in this case, if in my bin J, I have an item that has a weight of greater than a half, then I'm sure that my algorithm is a three halves approximation. Okay, but what about the other case? So let's say that all the items in this bin, all the items in bin J have small weights. What does this tell me now? So all of my heavy items appeared before bin J, right? But let's just look at this part and let's see what happened here. So I have a bunch of light items here, but these light items, none of them actually fit on top of any of the previous bins here, right? Because if I could fit any of these items here on top of one of the bins here, I would just add it there. That's my algorithm. I'm always adding the item to the first bin that I can. Okay. What else do I know? Well, I know that all the items appearing here have a weight that is at most a half, right? So I can be sure that each one of the bins here has at least two elements in it, right? Because I only have light elements of weight less than or equal to a half. And so each one has at least two except for probably the last one. It might be that I ran out of elements and the last one has only one element. So how many elements do I have in these bins in total? The number of elements in these bins is going to be K minus J times two plus one, right? Because from index J to index K minus one, each one of them have at least two elements. And this last one, it has at least one element. Now, what else do I know? I know that none of these elements could fit on top of any of these previous bins, okay? But the number of elements that I have here is actually more than the number of bins that I have on to the left of J. Let's just, just do the calculation, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take each one of my elements here and I'm going to put them on top of each one of these bins. So for bin one, I just take one element that used to appear in this right side and I put it on top of bin one. Now bin one doesn't have enough capacity, so it's overflowing. So what I'm putting in bin one uh, has a weight of more than one, but that's fine. I, I just do it like that for now. And then I do the same thing with bin two, bin three, all the way to bin J minus one. Now I have J minus one bins and each one of them is filled with items whose size is more than one, whose total size is more than one. So now I can talk about my total size. So what is the sum of the sizes of all the items? Well, I have J minus one bins and all of those J minus one bins are overflowing. So this is more than J minus one, right? But again, my optimal was even greater than this sum. So my optimal value is greater than J minus one. So my optimal value is at least J. And again, this is what I wanted because J is two thirds of K. 
and k was the number of pins that are used. So the optimal number of pins to use is more than two thirds the number of pins that are used. So this is again a three halves or one and a half approximation. So we just had a case work and in both cases, we got the same approximation ratio. So overall, this simple algorithm to just sort the items based on their weight and then use first fit, this is going to give us the best possible approximation ratio. And we know that if we want to have an approximation ratio that is even a little bit better than this, like even some epsilon better than this, that's NP hard. Okay. But does this mean we cannot do anything better? Well, not necessarily. Actually, this whole hardness results and approximation and everything, they're just assuming that we have the most general case of the beam packing problem. So let's see if we can find better approximation ratios if we put some extra limitations on how our instances look like. Okay. So I'm going to put two limitations and hopefully I'm going to show that we can solve it using those two limitations. But then in the next session, I'm going to focus on how to remove those limitations and get to the most general case that we can actually solve. Okay, so let's say that I want to have a one plus epsilon approximation for any epsilon because that's the most desirable thing that we have here. And I'm going to add these two assumptions to my input. So my first assumption is that I'm going to say all of my sizes are at least epsilon. So I want to say that for every I, SI is greater than or equal to epsilon. Now, this assumption is really making the problem less general because in the original problem, I had no such limitation. I could choose any real value between zero and one. And just saying that you cannot choose as close to zero as you like, that already makes the problem easier. So this is my first assumption. And my second assumption, is that I'm going to say that the number of distinct weights is not too much. So let's say I have at most, let's call it K, K distinct sizes. So basically I'm saying that all of my sizes, even though I have N elements, the size of each element is taken from a set that had k different values and all of those values were at least epsilon. Okay, does this help me in getting a better approximation ratio? I'm going to get a p-test, not an fp-test. Okay. So, any ideas about how we can brute force this thing? I want to just do a brute force, but I want to do a brute force in a way that pushes all the complexity on epsilon in a sense. Think about designing an XP algorithm in the parameterized sense. So I want to find a brute force XP algorithm where epsilon is my parameter. So first of all, we mostly work with one over epsilon. So let's just give that a name. So I don't know, I'll, I'll call it M. So let's say M is one over epsilon. What do I know about the size of each one of my bins in the sense of how many elements can go in each bin? Well, I can have at most M elements in each bin, right? Because my bins have a capacity of one and I'm assuming that each one of my elements is going to take epsilon of that capacity. Okay, so very simple, every bin, has at most M items in it. 
Okay. But what does this tell me about the different uh, configurations of items that I can have inside the bin? So if I put a bunch of items inside the bin, first of all, the order of these items don't matter to me, right? Secondly, if I have two items that have the same size, I don't really need to distinguish between these two items because I can just swap them whenever I want. So when I want to describe a particular bin, I'm just going to say how many items of each weight are going to be put into that bin, okay? So what is the number of possible bins? So, or possible configurations of items in bins. I just want to find an upper bound on it. So let's forget the sizes of items for a second. We have K different types of items, right? Because I said I have at most K distinct sizes. So I have K different types of items and I want to fill a bin and I want to put at most M items in that bin. In how many ways can I do this? So, if you remember from combinatorics, this is basically solving this uh, equation, x1 plus x2 to xk is less than or equal to m, right? So x1 is the number of items of the first possible weight category. x2 is the number of items of the second possible weight and so on. And I have to pick a bunch of items, but I have to pick at most m. Okay, how would we solve this? Well, first of all, the way that we get rid of the inequality is that we just introduce a new variable plus xk plus one is equal to m. And then this is like a classical balls and bins problem, right? So suppose that I have, or sorry, balls and balls, I think. So suppose that I have m balls, And I want to put K vols in between them. Right? And if, for example, I put two vols like this, this means that my X1 is two, my X2 is also two. I just count the number of vols between any two vols, and my X3 is one. Okay? So I basically want to find the number of permutations where I have m balls and k balls, and this is just m plus k choose k, right? Because I have m plus k different positions. I have to choose k positions where I put my balls, and then in all the remaining m position, I put my balls. So this is the number of possible configurations. So in other words, in this case, the number of different types of bins that I can have is at most this much. Okay. Now, how would I brute force this? What is the maximum number of bins that I can possibly use? Do you agree that I, I would never use more than N bins? Okay. So again, let's apply the same argument. Let's consider how many bins of each type I have. So I have these many types of bins, but how many bins of each type? So let's give this a name. Let's call this alpha. So I have alpha different bins, and I want to take some number of each type, and overall I want to take at most n bins. So this is again the same thing. It's like x1 plus x2, so on to x alpha is less than or equal to n this time. And so the number of solutions here is just going to be n plus alpha choose alpha. And I can just try every one of these solutions. Okay, now how much time does this take? So if you look at alpha, 
alpha actually only depends on k and epsilon, right? Because m is just one over epsilon. This alpha here, it's completely independent of the number of items m. And this thing, this is at most n plus alpha to the power of alpha. Right? So my overall runtime is in a sense XP with respect to alpha. Or in other words, I have a PTAS. But the difference is that I'm actually finding an exact solution because I'm brute forcing every possibility. Yeah, maybe instead of calling it a PTAS, we can just call it an XP algorithm with respect to one over epsilon. And again, this is a very trivial algorithm. But in the next session, what we're going to do is that we're going to remove these assumptions and see what happens. So for example, we're going to remove the second assumption first and get some approximation ratio. And then we're going to remove the first assumption and get kind of a worse approximation ratio. What's really interesting here is that at the end of it, I'm going to show you an algorithm that does something like this. So let's say K is the number of bins that we have. I show you an algorithm where K is at most one plus epsilon times optimal plus one. Okay. And this is kind of mind blowing because we know that we cannot have better than three halves times optimal, but we can have one plus epsilon optimal plus one. This plus one is doing a lot of heavy lifting there. And that's again, because if you think about it, when we were proving the hardness, the hardness really came from the case where the optimal was two, right? And this plus one is already breaking that case. So yeah, in the next session, we will see an algorithm that gives this bound and relaxes those requirements.